So you're muted again. All right. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, thanks again. Um, so I appreciate you coming on. I know you're very busy. Uh, you're in the middle of teaching again, right? So it's actually mid-semester break this week. So um, we always get after Easter, we get the rest of the week without students. So I'm not teaching this week, but normally, yes, this time. No, no, that's very cool. Um, so I was curious, were you, did you grow up a Christian or um, were you away from religion or another religion possibly? So um, my family going back generations is Methodist. Um, so my great grandparents all came out to Australia in the gold rush in the 1850s and most of the parts of the family are Methodist, um, certainly the Oppies. Uh, my parents were Methodist so I went to Sunday school and church when I was growing up and then uh, somewhere around the age of 12 or 13 I just stopped believing. Hmm. It was weird because when I grew up, it was the polar opposite. And I, I grew up with, um, we never went to church, but we had one of those big decorative Bibles, you know, like the mm -hmm. rose, you know, like big cloth on it and you turn it. Um, or they pulled it out when somebody died, like a funeral book. Um, so yeah. what kind of made you um, interested then, I guess, where you landed in philosophy? So philosophy, I been interested in since I was a teenager. Um, for my 16th birthday, I was given a copy of Bertrand Russell's autobiography, and I read that. And I was quite impressed and thought that I'd like to be like Russell. Um, and his intellectual interests, he'd studied maths and physics and philosophy. And so I set out to do the same. And I ended up becoming a professional philosopher, though it's a kind of long journey from 16 to the end of the PhD. And for those not familiar with Burton Russell, he had the famous teapot analogy? Um, yeah, that's him. I mean, he's in philosophical circles, he's much more famous for his work on logic and the philosophy of mathematics than he is for his work on philosophy of religion, which was really a side issue and something that he sort of only did at a popular level and then when you were um pursuing philosophy was there like um a particular field that interested you more like like something that was like hey this is my niche and this is where i'm going so my phd was in philosophy of language and i guess i thought that um that would be the field that i would end up working in though i had a wideish range of interests and over time I've published in aesthetics, um, philosophy of mind, um, logic, uh, metaphysics, epistemology. So I've published in a range of areas of philosophy apart from philosophy of religion, which ended up being my main specialization. That's very cool. And then a question that like, cause the first time I saw you, you were wearing a particular shirt. And I was told it's a cricket shirt. Is that correct? Um, yes. So it's part of the, the merchandising for the cricket club that I play with. So I've been with the Glen Waverley Cougars. I'm the, the secretary of the club. I've played there. Well, next season will be my 13th season with them. So I've been playing with them for quite a while. And I like to wear their gear as much as possible. So I wear it when I'm out and about just to advertise the team. So, uh, what made you kind of fall in love with that? Like, um, you're still doing these sports, you enjoy it? Um, so, back back in the 60s, um, boys, m most Australian boys would have played some cricket and depending on where they live in Australia, either Australian rules football or rugby league. Um, I loved cricket as a kid. Um, I played junior cricket, but then when I reached the age of about 20, I stopped playing. There was just too much else to do in life. And I came back to it in my very late 40s because I had the opportunity to play in the same team as my sons. So I played quite a bit of cricket with them over the last decade. 
Uh, and I like cricket just as much as I did when I was a kid. No, I love that. I, I thought about going back and doing uh, some of the sports that I loved eventually, but it's very harder because I was a wrestler, and it's harder to kind of get in, <laughs> to get into mm. that particular sport. Um, so uh, I, I've kind of read some of your materials, some of your books. Uh, what would be like if, if I had to say, hey, what is the one book you would recommend us to read of yours? Okay, so that's kind of a difficult question. I mean, partly it depends what you're looking for. I mean, the most accessible book that I've written, the one that perhaps would be easiest to read if you don't have much background in philosophy, would be the last one I wrote, Atheism, The Basics. So Routledge has this series, The Basics, and it's meant to provide a fairly easy introduction to whatever the subject matter of the book is. And so that would probably be the one I would recommend. Though I would point out that there's a there's one chapter in there that's pretty heavy going, even so. Um. No, that's interesting. Um, now, um, as we talked, I am a Christian, and I really, really enjoy uh, hearing your conversations, your videos. The first person who ever dropped your name on a video that I watched was um, William Lane Craig. Um, so... If you had to, and I, I'm not sure if you've been asked this before, but if you had to, to, to they said, all right, we're going to sit down. We want you to figure out what would be the best argument for God's existence. If you had to, like, try to pin something down, what do you think that might be? So I think it would look a bit like the argument that Richard Swinburne developed in his book, The Existence of God. So it'll be a cumulative case argument. It will consider a whole range of different pieces of evidence and claim that they fit together to um, sort of inductively support the claim that God exists. I think that's going to be the strongest form of argument that you could come up with. Uh, it's certainly very similar to my own approach. I think that the strongest argument for atheism goes the same way. Right? You try to collect together all the evidence and then try to work out where it points. Uh, I think that kind of individual arguments are bound to be weaker than the cumulative case argument, unless you think you've got a knockdown proof, right? So you might think that you've got a kind of logical demonstration. But um, my experience in philosophy is that on philosophical topics and topics like this one, it's very unlikely that you're going to have a knockdown proof. It's going to come down to uh, a kind of... A, a much wider ranging assessment. So, so Swinburne, Swinburne's argument would be the kind of argument that's going to be the strongest. No, that, that makes sense. Um, I always like using terms, uh, philosophically speaking, as far as when we describe atheism or theist. Uh, what are your view on just the use of atheism today and how atheist is applied? So. Once you've got a term that um, some people think um, would be a positive term to apply to them, then you tend to get um, different people using the term in different ways so they can have the term apply to them. And in uh, the kind of, I'll, I'll just call it the sort of non-religious community, um, there, is, there are a range of people who think that atheism is a term that, you know, they'd like to have applied to them. And so there's quite a range of different uses of the word. Um, there are some people who reserve the word atheism for people who positively believe that there aren't any gods. And then there are other people who want to use the word atheism um, to apply to people who simply don't have belief in God. Um, but may not positively disbelieve that there's no God. Um, in my written works and in my published works, I make a definition. So I go with the atheism is the claim that there are no gods uh, and say that's how I'm going to use the word, not thinking that that's laying down a law for everybody else, but just so that you'll understand me when I make use of the word atheism, what I mean by it. 
Um, and it sort of makes conversation slightly more complicated that people use words in different ways, but it happens all the time and you just get used to it. You just have to remember, oh, this person's using the word not quite the way I would use it. I have to understand them according to their way of using the word. And that's a great point because um, while I like using it in the philosophical terminology, I do recognize that Anthony Flew uh, kind of moved that goalpost a bit. And so if I'm talking with somebody, I think it's it's fair to use the term that they're using versus try to like say you're automatically a hard atheist. Prove to me God doesn't exist because that's not, not typically the case. So... I mean, I, th I think that's right. You can't, you can't expect that everybody is going to use words exactly the way you do. And so in order to make um, communication possible, you have, to be, you have to be able to interpret them as they mean what they're saying. Mm -hmm. um, and last time we talked, uh, we had actually met once on the Empathetic Atheist Show. Um, we had talked about brute facts, and you'd said that a uh, brute fact is something that, and correct me if I'm wrong at any point, uh, a presupposition that you have to have, but the goal is to have as few brute fact presuppositions. Is that true? So I wouldn't use the word presupposition exactly, but what I would say is in your theory, there are going to be some uh claims that you make that are kind of basic claims that are not going to be supported by anything else. So there'll be certain things that you postulate that you take not to have a further explanation. And what I what I mean by things being brute is, so we can call them brute facts if you like, um, is that these are the things in your theory that are basic that you take not to have a further explanation. Now, every theory is going to have lots of things like that in it, but you would prefer to minimise the number of brute aspects of your theory. One of the kind of goals of a good theory is to explain as much as possible and to minimise the amount of things that go unexplained. Yeah, because I remember when we had talked, it was about morality and that there were certain things that, like, morally speaking, that we seem to intuitively know is wrong. And um, we kind of we kind of hit that uh, in particular. Do you have any further thoughts on that? So I'm happy with the idea that there are true moral claims. Right, so an example that we must have used the last time that we talked, because it's the example that I always use, is that it's wrong to torture small children for your own pleasure. Right Now, I think that's just true. Right? Now, it's an interesting question, um, much debated in moral philosophy, about what would make it true if it was true. Right? But I do think that it's true, right? So that makes me a, a, what philosophers would call a moral realist. So you said you would be a moral realist. Mm. Now, um, when we talk about morality, objective versus subjective, um, what are your issues when people would say that morality is more subjective than that point being objective? Um, Okay, so I guess I want to ask people whether they really think that, to use in my example, that it's okay to torture infants for your own pleasure. Do they really think that that's okay? Is it really just a kind of subjective thing? And if other people think that it's fine, well, you know, anything goes. Um, that seems sort of abhorrent to me, and I expect that most people would recognize that most people would want to say no there's a there's a there's something objective here something it really just is wrong to torture infants for your own pleasure that's what i that's i so i would i would try to argue just directly on 
on that point. No, I mean, it makes sense because who would want to would want to presuppose the opposite that everything is subjective because in doing so then almost the barriers between right or wrong or how we would define that they all fall apart right so if you're if you're a subjectivist you'll have plausibly you'll have some views about what's right and wrong but you allow that other people could have completely different views about what's right and wrong and then there are these kind of coordination issues about what we do when you say it's right and I say it's wrong. Uh, it will be um, a much more satisfactory state of affairs if, as I think is the case, there was agreement about a whole lot of moral claims. I mean, I think that there's kind of very deep agreement about a lot of morality, not about all of it. Um, I can illustrate it with an example. So um, a fairly basic moral principle, I think, is that it's wrong to kill except when you're allowed to, right? Now, that might sound trivial, but it's not because the um, we can say something about the, the cases where you're allowed to and on any view, they don't, they don't turn out to be very extensive, right? So, for example... You can kill in certain cases in self-defense, right? So if in the circumstances it was plausible that the only thing you could do to protect yourself was to kill the other person, then that's fine, right? You're justified if you end up killing them. And most people will accept that. There are very few people that are going to reject it, right? So the wrongness of killing has qualifications that's already if you accept what i just said that's already established and the question is just okay so what are the cases so take another example suppose that it's not you but your nearest and dearest who are under attack and the only way that you can save them is by killing plausibly in the circumstances it's reasonable for you to think the only thing you can do is kill the other person so you do in that case too um most people i think will say that was justified right you're there was nothing wrong with the killing in that case. Eventually, we'll come to cases where it's controversial, right? There's a bunch of cases where it's controversial, where the killing is um, okay or not. Um, so the agreement on the basic principle that, you know, it's wrong to kill except when you're allowed to is in place, but there is going to be dispute about some of the cases, whether this is a case where it's okay to kill or not. And I think lots of morality is like that. Lots of moral principles are like that. Um, so to take a different example, lying is wrong, except when you're allowed to, right? And then we'll have this disagreement about some cases. Lots of cases, it'll be straightforward. You shouldn't lie in those circumstances. And then there'll be some cases where it's not so clear. So... No, no, I, so I, I'm, I'm going. No, that, that's enough. No, no, I appreciate your thoughts on this because objective and subjective morality comes up quite often in these uh, conversations. And, I've, and I always tell people that I'm a Christian, but I, I don't assume that any atheist or agnostic wants to just go out killing people. Like, I don't believe that that's the case. So I, I, I like that we're both agreeing that there is this recognition. And now we would disagree on the cause. I would say God you may say something different. Yeah, so I said, I think that these claims are true. What makes them true, that's not so clear, right? There's a lot of disagreement among philosophers. I'm inclined to think that they're necessary truths and so they don't need anything which, which, which will make them brute, right, I'm by my lights. Maybe not at the, at the level of it's wrong to torture infants for your own pleasure because I think that's probably derived from some more fundamental principle, but eventually you'll get back to some base level principles and I think that they're just necessary. So um, it couldn't have been otherwise. And I actually think probably that how could it be otherwise? How could it have been that it was okay to torture infants for your own pleasure? It seems to me that probably that principle is necessary. 
But then if it's necessary, it's true no matter what. It doesn't need something else to make it true. So mm. um, according to me, I mean, you if, if you've got a divine command theory or something else going, you might think that there's a way of explaining these things. Um, but for me, they will just turn out to be sort of fundamental. And that seems fine. Mm -hmm. And if you don't mind uh, backtracking just a little bit, but somebody, there's a few questions in the chat, if uh, you don't mind. Um, one was kind of a fun one. Um, it, I'll see if I can get it on the screen. It says, can you, yep. Who is your favorite, favorite cricket favorite players? Cricket players. Um, yeah, that's, that's an interesting question. I, I mean, I, I tend not to think about sports in those terms, identifying favourite cricketers. One person I really like in women's cricket is Elise Perry. I think that she's an outstanding cricketer. So maybe I'll go with that. No, I, I, I definitely, definitely like that. That was a good question from the audience. Uh, let me see. There was another one. Um, this is from Moel. It says, how would you justify that under naturalism? I think he's referring to our morality conversation. Yeah. So, the, what, okay, so this answer will be a bit longer than the last one. I think of naturalism as a claim about the causal domain. And so naturalists are free to believe whatever they want about abstract objects, um, for example and um, about values. I'm taking it that there's no causal story that we're going to tell about abstract objects and there's no causal story that we're going to tell about normative things either. So um, naturalism, the way that I'm thinking about naturalism, doesn't put any constraints. And so it's straightforward that the story that I was just telling um, about morality is consistent with my naturalism. No, no, and I, I think that was the only two questions that popped up. Um, and then what are your plans kind of going into the future? Like, uh, do you have another book in the works? Do you have uh, potential okay, debates so, or? So, so I've been doing lots of discussions like this one, and I plan to keep doing that. Uh, I do have a book coming out. Well, it's not just me. So Kenny Pierce and I have written a book together. It's a debate book about the existence of God. And it, I think that it's just going to press now and it'll be out sometime in the second half of the year. But that's for me, that's old because we finished that quite a while ago. It's the, the, the writing part is the fun part about, about producing a book. And then after that, there's all this boring stuff about trying to get it into a fit state for publication. We've been going through all of that, but I think we're there. Um, what I'm working on at the moment, at least in theory, is a new book about um, arguments. So I have some fairly unusual views about what good arguments are, and I want to give that subject a kind of book length treatment so i'm anticipating that i'll spend the next three or four years writing that book no that's fascinating um i like that the other book that you're just getting ready to publish so it would be you are debating him within the book uh, yeah so what so the way the book's structured we each get to make an opening statement then we get to comment on the other person's opening statement and then we both reply so it's in, from, from my point of view, it's in three parts. And from his point of view, it's in three parts as well. From Kenny's point of view. No, that's very, very interesting. Um, and then for the second book you mentioned, uh, could you maybe give us like an example of what that, uh, a new book you might be working on? Like maybe one of those arguments? So lots of people think that when you're presented with an argument, it's going to be a bunch of premises and a conclusion, and the argument will be good just in case the conclusion is supported by the premises and the premises are true, have some favourite property, are true. Now, I think that that's not a very useful way of 
thinking about arguments. And so I want to I want to suggest an alternative way of thinking about arguments. Now, what Marx is radical is that what I just described is so standard that everybody in every discipline accepts that way of thinking about arguments. Um, so uh, it's kind of it's a long road to try and argue against it. <laughs> No, that's very interesting. Um, so uh, the past couple of conversations I've had with people, we've kind of hit towards the end. Uh, one of the classic theistic arguments. Uh, last time it was the Kalam. Uh, I would just wanted to get your thoughts on the fine-tuning argument. Okay. Okay, so... There's... Several, I mean, there are so many things to say about the fine tuning argument. I'm not sure where to start. Um, one thing that always comes up is the question about whether the fact that we see this um, fine tuning in the various constants in the physical theories that we've got at the moment is a kind of permanent feature of physics, or whether in some future physics, all of those constants will disappear, or at least all of the, um, you know, the, the constants that look as though they're fine-tuned. So that's the kind of question about whether the argument will survive future progress in science or not. I've got no competence to judge that question. Um, so I'll mention that and just put it to one side. So now suppose that It really is true that um, had the value of one of these constants been slightly different, the universe would have been unimaginably different. Either would have lasted for a tiny fraction of a second, just collapsed in, in on itself immediately, or blown up so quickly that it was forever basically just empty space with the occasional blip, a little bit of matter here and there. Um, supposing that that's that that was true what sort of explanation might we want to give of that fact um, one thought that which is attractive to theists is that the values take the values that they do because god wanted there to be a universe that had human beings and life and stars and all kinds of stuff in it rather than a universe that was empty or didn't last very long. Some people who don't like that story think the answer's got to be that there are many universes um, and most of them last for only a tiny fraction of a second or blow up very quickly, but there's a small number because there are so many universes and the assignment of the constants is random, there are some where you get um, that turn out to be universes like ours. And of course, the only universes where there can be observers of the constants are ones exactly like ours. So um, there's a kind of ready explanation if there's many universes for why the universe we observe, or why, why we are observing a universe that has those values, and yet it's not surprising that there should be such universes. Um, that story relies on the assumption that there are many universes, and while there are some physicists who seem to think that on independent grounds that that's very plausible. I'm in no position to judge. It sounds like, um, it sounds kind of far-fetched, but then lots of other stuff in physics sounds far-fetched too. I mean, I mean, that's as much as I'm prepared to say. Put that aside, what are the chances? What, sorry, what are the options for someone who doesn't want to go with the many universes and doesn't want to go with God, what else can they say? Um, well, there's a bunch of things. One thing that you might say, which I've played around with quite a bit, um, is that the initial state of the universe is necessary. So if the values of the constants are fixed in the initial state, they actually couldn't have been otherwise. And so you've got an explanation of why they take the values that they do. Um, there's a whole lot more that you have to add to that story, um, but probably now's not the time to go into it. Nope, and we've hit the 30-minute mark too, so um, I want to thank you once again for coming on. 
Um, I appreciate the people watching the video. Um, I'm going to put up the end credits, and then after that, we'll stand for just a minute, and then um, uh, we will let you guys go. Mm -hmm.